Hey everybody, it's Taylor Sparks from the University of Utah back with another video in our Materials Informatics Theory. And today we're talking about Bayes' Theorem and Naive Bayes and featuring a green screen. So I'm taking up less space on the screen while I talk about it. Okay, the whole idea of Bayesian versus frequentist is one of the great debates in machine learning. And there's some fun XKCD comics. Go ahead and pause the screen if you want. But in principle, frequentist machine learning, again, machine learning is asking a computer to do something that normally a human would do without telling it how to do it. And the way that it does that is by finding patterns in lots and lots of data. That's frequentist. Bayesian machine learning, right, is a different approach where it relies off of probabilities. Sometimes it's called probabilistic machine learning for that reason, right? And uh, there are some pretty big differences in frequentist versus Bayesian. For example, in frequentist, the data is a repeatable random sample and there is a frequency. But in Bayesian statistics, data is fixed and there's probably just a few samples. In a frequentist approach, there's no expression of belief, right? At least, you know, nothing formally present. It's just an objective view based on probabilities. But in Bayesian, we approach the idea with a belief, right? This is formally presented and it's subjective view on probability, right? Uh, in other words, you start out with a belief, then you collect new data and then you update your belief. So you hear about a prior and a posterior, that's what it's talking about. You had a prior assumption about grain size and strength then you measured something and then you update your prior with now a posterior because you learned something hopefully, right? In frequentist, we use these point estimates and you have things like least square estimates. But in Bayesian, now you have a, a posterior distribution, right? And so you're thinking about things in terms of distributions typically. Um, in frequentist, the parameters are fixed and unknown. In Bayesian, the parameters are unknown random and we describe them probabilistically. Um, in frequentist, we often think about confidence intervals, right? Whereas in Bayesian, there's actually a credible interval. There's some slight differences there. In frequentist, we have this idea of statistical hypothesis testing via the so-called p-value, right? Is something statistically significant or not? Whereas in Bayesian, right, uh, Bayes' factor is a direct test of the null and alternate hypothesis. And so we have a measure of strength of evidence. Um, generally speaking, frequentist is less computationally intensive, but more data intensive. Bayesian is more computationally intensive, less data intensive. There's exceptions to all these, and there's combinations of these, right? Bayesian neural nets are a good example, where instead of updating the weights of the model as fixed values, you're updating them as distributions, right? So there, there's ways to combine these, but those are some general differences. So before we get into it, I'm guessing that most people aren't familiar with conditional probability. So we should probably start there with what is conditional probability, because it turns out to be an important part of describing Bayes' theory. So I'm borrowing this, well, I'm adapting it from a really great video by Josh Starmer over at StatQuest on YouTube. Great channel, absolutely love it. And I'm gonna adapt it from material science. So here on the left, um, we see a bunch of different compounds, right? Lanthanum, yttrium sulfide, lithium, manganese oxide, all the way down, there's 13 of them. And I'm gonna ask a couple different questions, right? You've, you're familiar with the idea of Venn diagrams. If we had a Venn diagram showing which materials are oxides, which materials are perovskites, and which ones are both or neither, we could populate it with all these 13 materials, right? Here we see all of our oxide materials, but these are also oxide, but they're not only oxide, but they are perovskite, whereas these two are perovskites, but not oxides. And these four down here are not oxides, not perovskites, okay? We can rewrite that same information in what's called a contingency table, right? Here you see in this column, these are all not, uh, these are oxides. This column, these are not oxides. This row is perovskites. This row is not perovskites. And these individual cells satisfy two criteria. You know, in this one, it is an oxide. It is a perovskite. It is not an oxide. It is a perovskite and so forth. Okay. All right. If this is our data to start with, let's think about some probabilities now. For example, the probability that you're familiar with is based off of the data that you've seen before. So for example, if I asked you, what's the probability of the next material being an oxide perovskite, what would be the answer? Well, you would come over here and you'd look at your contingency table and say, if the next material is an oxide and a perovskite, well, we only saw three of those out of 13 before. So the probability is three out of 13. Right? Same thing over here, what's the probability that it's just an oxide, only one criteria? Well, there you'd say, well, we saw seven examples of oxides out of 13. Same thing over here, perovskite, we saw five examples out of 13. So that is just 
basic probability. It's based off of the what we've seen in the past, right? Oxide perovskite, probably 3 out of 13 or 0.231% chance. What's the odds of it being of an oxide? There you go, right? This is, this is essentially frequentist. So we're going to modify that to now do something called conditional probability, right? And we use our contingency table to do that. So a, a conditional probability is just what it sounds like. It's the probability of something with some condition attached to it. And the notation looks like this. So P means probability. Everything inside the parentheses is the probability of something happening. So the first thing is that what's the probability of it being an oxide perovskite? And then you have this vertical bar right here and then oxide. What that means is that it's asking, what's the odds, what's the probability of it being an oxide perovskite given that, or if we already know that, it's an oxide. So that changes the math a little bit, right? Because look back over here. If we know that it's an oxide, there were seven of those, what's the odds of it being a perovskite? Well, three out of seven, instead of three out of 13, because now we know something, we have a condition. We know that it's an oxide, so there's only seven oxides. So what's the odds of it being an oxide perovskite? Well, now that's three out of seven, right? That is a conditional probability. Same thing over here. What's the probability of it being a perovskite if you know that it's not an oxide? What's the odd probability of being a perovskite if it's not an oxide? We come back here, we'd say, okay, perovskite is right here, and if it's not an oxide, that means that it is what's the odds of, if we know it's not an oxide, there's six of those, so now it's two out of six, okay? So these are different probabilities. In other words, it's a conditional probability is probability that has been scaled by some knowledge that we already have, okay? Bayes' theorem extends out of this concept of conditional probability. If you saw what we were doing in the, in the previous examples, all that we were doing when we had these conditional probability calculations, we looked which ones met the criteria and then divided that by which one met one of the criteria, right? We came over here, we said, okay, what's the odds of it being a perovskite and not an oxide? Well, the total number of not an oxide, that's the denominator is six. And then the one exact one that meets both criteria was two out of six. So it's, it's, it's a, you're taking a ratio, something divided by another. So these conditional probabilities are awesome, but they require that we know this numerator. You have to know the contingency table to start with. And what if you don't know that? How, what if you don't know the probability of two conditions being met? If that's an unknown, are you just out of luck? Can you not calculate these conditional probabilities? That's where Bayes' theorem came in with a really simple proof. Uh, forgive the, the math here. I'm just going to write it in terms of A and B instead of oxide or perovskite or whatever else, right? But they're just conditions. So we just finished saying that the conditional probability of something being both A and B, given that you know that it's B, that that's just the joint probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. So Bayes' theorem was really clever. It said, okay, what if you don't know this numerator? If you don't know that numerator, you can move this denominator, this PB, over to the other side, and now that equals P, A, B. So the joint probability of A and B is just equal to the conditional probability A and B given A times the probability of A. Or it's also equally, you know, equal to the joint probability, the, the conditional probability of A and B given B times the probability of B. That allows us to write out Bayes' theorem. Okay? If that didn't quite make sense, don't worry. I'm going to give us an example here, okay? Uh, and, and show you how we use it. So how do we use this? The idea, and the most common way they'll talk about Bayes' theorem is this idea of having some sort of likelihood, data, and a prior, right? Bayes' theorem allows us to take in the likelihood of an event occurring, some probability, actual data, and our prior thought on it to then output a posterior distribution, something where you've learned it. So priors and po posteriors come before and after you sample additional new data points and test out what you thought you knew about your model. And then you update your model and you collect another data point. It's a, it's a way to iteratively learn. And honestly, this is what humans do, right? It's like if I see um, some new car and I don't know the name of that model, right? I ask somebody. And then if I see another thing that looks kind of like it, I'm going to be more likely to recognize that that's the right model. Right? I've learned. My internal model has learned. And if it's actually like, oh, no, that's actually like the model XLE as opposed to XE, okay, then I update my model a little bit in having learned a little bit new information, like, oh, there's actually slight differences in these models of, of whatever it is I'm looking at, okay? So 
The simplest, like most absolute simple way to implement Bayes' theorem would be naive Bayes or what's called a multinomial Bayes classifier, na naive Bayes classifier. So let's do it in the example of material science for a moment. Um, consider that you are building a classifier that's trying to predict whether something is an insulator or whether it's a metal, okay? So let's say you have some amount of labeled data. Well, you could go element by element in your feature vector, you know, component by component in your feature vector, whatever that consists of. Um, for, for simplicity, let's assume that our feature vector only contains three entries, coordination number, um, whether or not it's an oxide, and whether the density is less than five or not, okay? So you're gonna go one by one through those and you're gonna calculate the regular probability of whether or not that condition being present in your insulator versus metal class, okay? So given that you had some labeled examples, this is an insulator, that's a, uh, a metal, we would calculate the following. What's the probability that it is an insulator given that the coordination number is equal to six? What's the probability that it's an insulator given that you know it's an oxide? We know that most oxides are not typically metals, so maybe that's got a higher probability. But coordination number six, that could go either way. We know that metals tend to be high coordination number, you know, um, eight or 12. Six is a little bit on the border, so maybe it's like a 50-50 odds there. What's the probability of it being insulator if you know the density is less than five? We know that insulators tend to be oxides. Oxides tend to be lower density, so maybe it's got slightly higher probability. Conversely, the opposite of those for metals, you know, what's the probability of it being a metal if the coordination number is equal to six, maybe it's got like a 0.3% uh, probability. What's the probability of it being a metal if it's an oxide, maybe it's 0.3%. What if the density is less than five, maybe it's 0.4, okay? So you have some probabilities. The way that we do this is we start out with our initial prior, because this is Bayes' theorem, you always start with the prior, right? And then you add to that likelihoods, or you multiply that by likelihoods. So our prior probability is going to be, okay, look at previous examples. Let's imagine that in our data set that we were training from, two thirds of our original data was insulators and only one third was metal. Therefore, if I'm predicting what's the odds of a next material from this distribution being an insulator or a metal, right? I'm gonna start with just my prior probability. So let's say I'm asking, what's the probability that a new material is going to be a metal? The first thing we multiply it by is just a regular probability that it was going to be a metal. In this case, that's one third, right? Because two thirds of our previous data were all insulators. So if I'm gonna guess, the first thing I'm gonna guess is that by one third's probability, it's going to be a metal but then I multiply that by these likelihoods. So these are probabilities that are conditional probabilities. Okay, what's the probability of it being a metal given that I know it's an oxide? I'm gonna multiply that by the probability of it being a metal given that I know that the density is less than five. Well, we took those from previous values, right? For a metal being an oxide, the probability is actually not very good. And for the metal having a density less than five is also not very good. So that 0.3 and that 0.4 get multiplied by one third, and all of a sudden our probability of the next material being a metal is quite low. And that makes sense, right? Most metals aren't oxides. Most of them don't have you know, low densities. And we started out with two thirds of our materials being insulators. So that, that this sort of makes sense, okay? Um, meanwhile, if you did the exact opposite, what's the probability that the new material is going to be an insulator? Well, we start out with the probability of being an insulator, that was two thirds multiplied by these two likelihoods, these are conditional probabilities, the odds of being an insulator given you know it's an oxide, odds of being an insulator given that you know it's low density, we figured those out, it's 0.8 and 0.6, okay? So this turns out to be, you know, 0.32. So if you're comparing the odds of something, this one has 0.32, this one has 0.04, so it's much more likely, given the information that we have, that we know it's an oxide and that we know it's low density, it's very much more likely that it's an insulator than a metal. This is Naive's classifier, right? Now there's some problems to this. Like for example, this approach would break if you came across a feature that was never in the training data set. So for example, if you said, by the way, I know that it is a perovskite. So therefore, what's the probability of this new material being a metal? You take your initial prior, your probability of being a metal. Now we're gonna say, what's the probability of being a metal if you know it's a perovskite, well, if that was never present in your data set, like you have no knowledge about it being a perovskite, therefore that would go to zero, right? That This entire term right here, and they're all being multiplied together, if that central term goes to zero, then the entire expression would go to zero, right? And so to fix that, 
you typically add a very small probability to each feature element, even if it's something you haven't seen before, just to force this not to go to zero, okay? So that is the, the simplest way to do this. Now there's a better way to do it because what we did before is based off of average values. But in the real world, we have more than just average values. We have average and we have sort of deviation from average, right? We can collect the average and we can capture the standard deviation for our features. So consider how we do this differently. Let's imagine for insulators, if I looked at all my examples, previous examples of insulators, the average value was four grams per cc but it had some standard deviation of two grams per cc. Same thing with average atomic size, maybe it had some size with some standard deviation, average electronegativity with some standard deviation, and you could do the same thing with metals. Well, now we can do the exact same approach, but now instead of using it with fixed individual values, we can think about it in terms of distributions, right? And there's many different ways that you could do distributions. The most common is gonna be a normal distribution, so we work with Gaussians, but you don't have to. In fact, my student, one of my students right now is actually working on whether or not Gaussian processes could be improved, or at least this approach of Bayesian uh, probabilistics approaches could be improved with a different type of distribution that maybe matches materials data a little bit better. In our case, we're looking at T-student distributions. But whatever the distribution, it's now going to, instead of saying everything is exactly one value, it's going to recognize that there's some variability, and we're going to capture that variability, in this case, with normal, uh, normal distribution. So let's see how that changes things, right? So just like with Naive Bayes, we're gonna start with our initial prior probability. So what's the odds of our new material being a metal? Well, we're gonna assume based off of previous examples, we have to multiply it by that, right? But if you know about your new material that its density is three, its average size is nine, and its average electronegativity is 1.5, you're gonna write it out the exact same as before. It's still a product of these initial probability and these three likelihoods, which are conditional probabilities. You're going to do that for both metal and insulator, and you're going to compare them. One thing that they often do is they'll take the log of these scores, and that is to prevent something called underflow, which is really what happens when the probabilities are just really small, or when one feature has like a large value as opposed to another. So it makes it so they're not, you know, uh, equally, so that they're a little more uh, equally important. Okay, so we're gonna do an example of this in a, in a notebook real quick. In our next video, we can see how this actually works with some real materials data. Uh, and then after that, we're gonna dive into talking about Gaussian processes, which are more sophisticated ways of dealing with um, Bayesian theorem for predicting, uh, for regression or for classification. Okay, stay tuned.